is into law. <laughs> Scott Simpson. Mr Speaker, this uh, habeas corpus amendment bill in the name of my colleague Chris Ockenvall is a good bill. Uh, the report back from the Justice and Electoral Select Committee, so ably chaired by my friend and former chair of that committee, Tim McIndoe, have done a good job. I support and commend this bill to the House. Andrew Little. Mr Speaker, it's a pleasure to take a call on the habeas corpus amendment bill. And, sir, as I said uh, in the first reading of, of this bill, we should never trifle with matters as serious and as important as habeas corpus. We know the status and standing of this application to a court. It comes under the court's inherent jurisdiction. It cannot be interfered with uh, by the Crown, and it is the, one of the important bulwarks against uh, fascism and tyranny and despotism. Uh, and so we tread very carefully when this House is required to formulate some rules and refinements uh, in terms of the way the court should handle these applications. And so when the, first, when the bill was first read, there were necessarily some issues that, um, that stood out immediately. And when judges are given the right or the power to uh, exercise discretions over the handling of applications before they've been considered and heard, effectively adding another hurdle before an, an applicant uh, can make their application, or when the judge has the power to delay or postpone the hearing of an application beyond the three days which has been accepted, then we should look very carefully uh, at, at such provisions in law. Now, it is very pleasing to see at this stage of the passage of the legislation that the Select Committee looking at the bill has made some quite significant and material changes. And my uh, colleague, the learned Leanne Dalziel, has taken us through the most, the most learned, the most learned uh, Leanne Dalziel, who, um, who, may be, uh, who may well be considered now as one of the first applicants under the QC legislation that was passed just before Christmas, is it? Or was that Chris Finlayson's going to get one of those now? But anyway, uh, she has taken us through, she has taken us through um, those important changes. And when you look at those changes, when you look at what has been taken out, uh, it is... Uh, it is significant and it is good that the, the Select Committee has done uh, their job in that regard. And I want to just um, draw attention to that important Clause 5, the, uh, the, section, the amendment to Section 9 which deals with urgency, and, and to uh, one of the important things that the Select Committee did was to ensure that it is not any officer of the court that can decide whether or not a, an application for habeas corpus will be given urgency. Under the 2001 legislation, an application for habeas corpus was, ha, had the effect of, I hesitate to use the term because it's used in the immigration um, arena most offensively, but to jump the queue and to push all other applications before the court out of the way for consideration. Now, actually, when it comes to the liberty of the citizen, the liberty of the individual, that is probably justified. Almost certainly it is justified. Um, but what the original drafting of the bill would have done is to allow not just a judge but a registrar or other officer of the court to decide whether or not that level of urgency should be given. The Select Committee has come back and has quite rightly said this is a matter for a judicial officer to, uh, to, to consider and to make a decision on. And it is true and it is one of the complaints under the 2001 legislation and indeed of habeas corpus applications is that occasionally Occasionally, there are frivolous applications and it puts other uh, applications before the court to a disadvantage. And so uh, while there should be some mechanism to deal with the potentially frivolous applications, particularly when they are applications that have been made before or potentially in other courts, um, then it is right that there should be some mechanism, but a very closely guarded mechanism for the uh, application to be considered for timetabling and place them before a judge in open court. And so the Select Committee has come back and said it must be a judge that makes that decision, and we look to our judges being independent uh, of the state, uh, being having the power to make that sort of judgment and that sort of decision. So that is the correct thing to do. And then as also in the next area, which is uh, convening uh, teleconferences, it is a good thing that 
our judicial system has developed and has kept pace with te technology is that judges and courts can be convened using the latest technology. The problem was with the bill as originally drafted is that it was completely superfluous in this bill because it, because it was already provided for in other legislation. But at least with uh, the use of video technology, it means that a judge can see that a citizen who has been detained, at least in arguably questionable circumstances, can actually be viewed through the, the technology before consideration is given to, to releasing uh, that citizen from detention where the case is made out. Uh, and so that change uh, has been made. And then, um, and that ties in with the, uh, the reference now to an application uh, proceeding under the Courts Remote Participation Act 2010, uh, which ties, or w which now deals with that. So, so these, uh, these, have, these are significant changes that have been made to this bill dealing with a very uh, important issue. And as I said at the beginning, when it comes to matters like habeas corpus, when it comes to matters of uh, dealing with the inherent jurisdiction of the court, um, we should always tread uh, lightly. These are matters, these go to the fundamental rights of every citizen. And when this parliament speaks, when this parliament acts, uh, the one thing it should be doing in passing any legislation, but particularly legislation that deals with either the detention or the possibility of releasing from detention, when this House is dealing with the liberty of the individual, then it is dealing with that most precious of commodities. Uh, and we need to uh, take cognizance of that and proceed, proceed cautiously and deliberatively and deliberately. So, uh, sir, it is good that we have done that, but I reiterate too the point that uh, Leanne Dalzi also made. When it comes to these matters, fundamental rights of the citizen, it is a matter for a minister to bring to this House, not a member in their, in their personal capacity. It is not an appropriate matter for the member's uh, provision. This is a matter that the Crown should speak on, that the Crown should take responsibility for when making these rules for courts to consider the liberty of the individual. And it is disappointing that uh, this government is developing a habit of taking important uh, matters of great importance that are matters for the government of the day, for the executive of the day, and handing them over to, to individual members to process through the members' part of, uh, of the proceedings of this House. And that does not um, uh, augur well. It does not send a good signal about the seriousness with which this government takes these important matters. When it has gone, when, when the procedures of uh, legal development or law development or statutory development have involved a body as august and as important as the Law Commission in its development, then the least we can expect is the responsible minister, in this case the Minister of Justice. And it's not as if she, was, uh, she had an exhaustive workload last year in terms of her legislation, but we had the alcohol law, the alcohol law reform legislation. She had, one or two, she had one or two administrative matters on her hand, but, but the ever-able Paula Rebstock was able to step in and clean up that mess. But sir, it's not as if that this is a minister who was rushed off her feet uh, with other legislation that she could not have taken this important matter, stamped her imprimatur on it and said as Minister of Justice she takes responsibility for important pieces of legislation dealing with the liberty of the individual, dealing with the liberty of the citizen and herded us and guided us through this piece of legislation. I would like to think that had this been a matter that was dealt with by the Minister for Justice, Minister of Justice, then it is more likely that a well-formed uh, piece of legislation would have made it to the first reading without the select committee having to uh, tire, it and tire itself and exhaust itself uh, with, its, with its amendments and changes to bring back to this House now a better quality piece of legislation than it was before it went to the select committee. Uh, let me have a look. I call the honourable member.